first of all, I'd like to thank um, my hosts. And I'm sorry I can't be with you in person this morning. Um, and uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your amazing presentation and um, to the Institute and for the wonderful ladies and gentlemen in the audience. And thank you for turning the camera so I can see everybody. Today brings uh, me to an intersection of two of my favorite worlds, the diplomatic world and the academic world. And I thought I'd share this morning some lessons from, from the past and offer ideas for engaging with thwarting the Iranian threat that we face on a global scale today. We had excellent news in the last couple of weeks when President uh, Biden reassured us that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, will not be removed from the foreign terrorist organization list where it was prescribed in 2019. Following the killing in broad daylight of, of the key IRGC operative, Colonel Hassan Sayyad Khodayari, Iran has gone very public, vowing vowing retaliation. We have yet to see how Iran will respond. Some report that Khodari was planning attacks against Israelis and Jews in Cyprus and Turkey and elsewhere. And therein lies the, our problem at hand. Third countries such as the UK and member countries of the EU must take the threat of the IRGC and Iran in general seriously in both policy and in law. When looking at the future today, I hear echoes of the past and take a moment to ponder, for instance, a quote from the Shah of Iran in June 1974, that the national security of Iran may be best served by possessing a nuclear, a, a, a nuclear deterrent. In these prophetic words, he said, if in this region, each little country tries to arm itself with armaments that are precarious, even elementary, but nuclear, then perhaps the national interests of any country at all would demand it to do the same. The Shah did add to placate his international allies, but I would find that completely ridiculous. This, I think, illustrates the problem that we have today as well, that if, if Iran were to go nuclear and to have a nuclear capability, others in the region would readily follow suit. And we are facing this grave situation on a daily basis. And, and uh, an arms race is, uh, you could see other allies already looking at the day post-Iran going nuclear. And this is something that must be stopped. First and foremost, I always begin by saying that this doesn't have to be our reality. As the ambassador mentioned, um, relations with the Iranian government under the Pahlavi regime were the polar opposite of what they are today. Israel and the West engaged with Iran to thwart the pan-Arabic pan threat in pre-1979. Israel enjoyed good relations with Iran as an unlikely bedfellow with thriving trade, oil trade, intelligence cooperation, defense cooperation, and excellent relations in agriculture, education, medicine, the list goes on. You can see on the left, my late grandfather, Meir Ezri, who was Israel's first ambassador to Iran. And when he was dispatched to go back to Iran, my family uh, goes, from, goes back to a long line of Iranian jewelry. Um, he was told by Ben Gurion, and his instructions were clear, do what is good for Iran. You can be sure it will be good for Israel. The Iranian people, like the ambassador said, are outward looking people. They're good people, they're educated, they're engaged and they're curious. And we're equal, it, we are seeing today, for example, in the post protests that are going on, that they are increasingly blaming their regime for the predicament that they're in. The uh, Iranian people are outward looking and historically, 
you could see, um, and I've got the wrong leader here, <laughs> you can see that uh, Defence and Military Corporation, <laughs> I meant to have the Shah and King Faisal. Let me see if it's in the next one. No, it's not. I will pull up a, a, a picture of that. It's quite interesting. So fr from defence and the military perspective, cooperation buttressed the stability between Israel and Iran. And uh, for example, there was an intelligence sharing group called Trident, where between 56 and 79, the intelligence sharing among USA, Israel and Iran really did make uh, intelligence cooperation easy seamless and they were able to thwart many threats together and ironically and I really do have to find a visual of this is when King Faisal visited Iran in 1964 the Iranian police was carrying Israeli Uzis so um, one of the uh, brilliant ironies of the Middle East from 1957 to 1979, Iran was Israel's main source of oil and energy, including, interestingly, the times of the oil embargoes of 1967 and 73. The Europe-Asia Asia Pipeline Company, Katza, that went from Elat Ashkelon since 1968, which ironically was uh, brokered by the Israeli diplomats at the time and the Iranians, um, were, was built to efficiently transport oil from Asia to Europe, um, so from Ashkelon and on to Europe. This will very interestingly be used by a newly formed agreement with the UAE to circumvent diff potential difficulties in the Persian Gulf and the Suez Canal. And this is because Iran militarily knows that um, oil transport route very well. And so the Gulf states are very wary of the security situation of transporting oil to, to Europe. And so have revisited the option of transporting oil to Europe via the Katza, um, via the Katza route. Another example is uh, in September 1962 in the Razvin earthquake where for the first foreign search, rescue and rebuilding crews were Israeli in a disastrous earthquake that killed more than 12,000 people. Israel and Israeli, Israeli experts provided um, both building engineers, water, uh, the Tahal Water Authority. They provided expert advice and actually rebuilt most of the region. And so if you were to see aerial views from the air at the, um, when the villages were built, they, um, they readily looked a lot like Israeli neighborhoods, which was uh, quite interesting. The same geopolitical elements since 1948 still exist, which is something that we have to keep in mind, um, such as the Russia, then the Soviet Union, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Saudi Arabia, the US, all of the same players are still actors in our scenario today. In, so from these flourishing relations, Iran's policy towards Israel changed literally overnight. For very symbolically, the Israeli embassy building in Tehran, which was one of the biggest in the region, was ransacked and given to Yasser Arafat of the PLO, which reflected that, that complete U-turn and turned the USA from the big Satan uh, to the big Satan and Israel to the little Satan. The ambassador really eloquently illustrated the global threat of Iran. And I'd like to offer some broad observations if we zero out a little bit onto um, on interacting with Iran on the world stage. In the nearer past and present, there are also lessons to note from the Russia-Ukraine conflict in dealing with Khamenei and Ibrahim Raisi in Iran. I'm, I'm going to highlight that as we go along. The balance of power has been flipped on its head with a new paradigm since the Abraham Accords. And with the Gulf states transferring um, transforming the Arab narrative and normalizing relations with Israel to balance against the Iranian threat, as well as other excellent reasons to support collaboration and coexistence, such as trade and technological advancement. 
The same nature of relations, interesting now, exists with Abraham Accord partners with which um, cooperation will be promoted to thwart the Iranian threat. Indeed, for example, the, um, the Tsul project was one that, um, that made Israel's closest strategic friend after the United States. So the Tsul project back in the late 70s was um, a, a huge project, which was based on an exchange of Iranian money for oil for six Israeli planned weapon systems. This project was abruptly ended with the Islamic Revolution and indicated that it indicates today, I think, that Iranians, the, and as the ambassador said, the, um, the choice really is in Iran, is one of the Iranian regimes. They can choose whether to make the area more stable and more prosperous and more secure or more insecure and more volatile. Increasing Israeli and Emirati Bahraini defense cooperation is also um, demonstrating to be a very effective strategic friendship. Under these normalization agreements, for example, we're seeing that the Israeli Navy, for example, has been, um, has been included into the US's central command. And so it's able to uh, collaborate closely with the US Fifth Fleet based in Bahrain. And um, very notice notably in April 2022, they conducted a joint drill. New alliances are also responding to strategic developments with Israel, for example, Israel, Egypt, and the UAE have formed a, a very interesting new axis where leaders can meet and uh, discuss new world developments. So, for example, they, they met in March 2022 for a trilateral summit to assess the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the influence of Iran in the Gulf. The entire region has global significance. The connections can be used to stabilize and destabilize quickly. Iran's alliance network pre-revolution did help to stabilize the region. And we can see that with the, uh, with the Islamic revolution, the establishment of the IRGC was one of the most major threats that were established to both um, to both reinforce the revolution and to export it via proxies and directly. We can see the parallels of, of the um, methods of warfare with the uh, Russian-Ukraine war, which we need to note as well. For instance, the West can't afford to be naive and we must take the threats of the leaders as, at their word, as the ambassador said. We can see this also from the Russia-Ukraine example, when Putin wrote an essay last year sharing his imperialist plans for Ukraine that was dismissed as internal posturing by the West. Ignoring the warning signs has partly got us to where we are today with Ukraine. Similarly, Khamenei's February 2019 manifesto, his uh, second phase of the Islamic revolution, was among other visions um, where he proposed purifying Iran and strengthening the IRGC to help realize Raisi's grand civilizational ambitions. It would have been inconceivable to see a Western country invade another. It's not inconceivable to see Ira an Iranian full-scale attack, and we must safeguard against it. Exporting the revolution, as I said, is part and parcel of the Iranian regime. And this is something that we can see is happening quite practically, and it must be uh, rebuffed. The Russia-Iran connection um, uh, to the war in Ukraine is also a very interesting one, where also where we look at the discourse of the Iranian leadership, we see that um, Iran's security chief, Ali Shamkhani, also supported Russia's military move into Ukraine. And the Iranian state television, which is financed to the tune of $200 million a year by the Iranian government, has been actively, um, actively praising the Russian aggression and advances and have, have actually um, said that what is happening is Ukraine, in Ukraine is, is um, 
an attempt to defend Russia against advances by NATO and therefore endorsing um, Russian activity. This is something that we, we need to keep a steady eye on because it can uh, destabilize the entire region once again and broaden Iran's reach. And very interestingly, it also needs to be watched at what happens in Vienna in the talks, um, because if, uh, Russia has been using and has been making certain demands on Vienna, onto um, the sanctions that would be uh, that would be applicable in cases where Russia were, were to want to trade with Iran. Iran's expansionist tendencies can be seen also, and we were, the ambassador was talking um, earlier about spending, which is a vital point to look at. Just for context, Iran will spend on its Revolutionary Guard this year more than double the amount that was allocated to it in 2021. The IRGC this year will receive $22 billion alone, this year alone in 2022. And this was the, these are according to Iranian government figures. Last year, the IRGC was given a budget of $9.5 billion. Just so that we compare the figures also, the um, country's conventional military last year received approximately $5.3 billion. And um, this year it's set to receive $7.99 billion. And so the IRGC, and it's something that is very, also can be, um, can be defended against in law. So many European, well, some European countries have been looking at designated, designating the IRGC as a terrorist organization. And that gives certain other legal methods to deal with the Iranian threat. And you can see that internally, the IRGC is poised to become even stronger as President Ibrahim Raisi consolidates his power base, fulfilling numerous key va vacancies with IRGC member members. And so Raisi also is seen as the next successor to Khamenei. And so his position must also be closely watched. And as the ambassador mentioned, the IRGC has sponsored and, um, and carried out attacks against various, various countries across the globe. And I think that his, his map was, uh, was an excellent one and should be noted and remembered because the range of Iran is huge. Another matter that needs to be look at, looked at is the threat, as well as the nuclear threat, is the threat of um, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs. And this is a threat, as the ambassador said, not just to Israel, but to the entire world. The Islamic Republic has thousands of ballistic missiles. They, their range is as far as um, 2,000 kilometers in any given direction. So it can go deep into India, China, high into Russia, to the north, uh, Greece, other parts of Europe, and um, can go as far south as Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. And we find that increasingly, as Iran builds a bigger capability, it increases in accuracy and in daring. And this is also part of Iran's um, strategy of asymmetric warfare. And... Um, these munitions are also, as the ambassador said, a, a cheap, effective way to, um, to come against um, the countries in the region. We can see how, how these uh, UAVs are distributed and tailor-made to each and every um, terrain. And also this is something that needs to be watched and that proliferation presents a clear and present danger. The daring of, of Iran is something that can be noted. For example, attacks on the UAE between 2019 and 2022. Um, the Iranian forces have threatened US forces in Erbil, in Kurdistan, and um, the drones in Syria and have attacked many US forces and, uh, and other Western allies. We can also see that this has also threatened, as the ambassador said, 
the um, wet, the oil supply to the rest of the world, as well as as well as um, physically to harming people. There have been British citizens that have been killed uh, by Iranian action and um, and other Europeans. And this is, uh, and for example, a, a couple of weeks ago, the Greek ship that was seized by, by Iranian-backed forces. And so the daring is something that is quite poignant. On the naval sphere also, since this is something that I study quite closely, the IRGC Navy um, is, is, and this is um, part of the Iranian strategy, where the IRGC and the conventional army have been pitted against each other um, and have been, uh, th there has been a very uh, much encouraged uh, competition, one against the other, by the Iranian regime. We see increasingly that, for example, the IRGC Navy and the conventional Navy have been working together. And this is especially in the maritime sphere. And this is something that is also a matter for concern. Another front in, in, this, uh, in this struggle is, is seeing the use of information of Iran, of Iran in social media. This is a powerful tool that makes takes public uh, public diplomacy to a new level, and it goes well beyond effective asbara, which is um, it's it, it's it's a term in Hebrew that's quite unique. It's public diplomacy, but uh, to a new level. It's uh, irate, it, so. For example, we saw in the last conflict in Gaza in May of last year that Iranian bots on social media internationally were working in the networks to incite violence against Israel and against Jews. This legally needs to be addressed with a multi-pronged approach as hate, hate speech laws are also being breached. This, this leads to very, very dangerous incitement and criminal activity. And we can see this on the streets. So for example, if I don't know whether you remember, there were many um, pro-Palestinian uh, quite violent marches in London and they went through Jewish communities in convoys, making uh, the Jewish communities feel extremely threatened. Iran also deploys divisive tactics to disturb the internal fabric of states. This has been on a violent scale by Hezbollah in Lebanon, where Lebanon is sadly a fail fail failed state. And there's been evidence of Iran attempting to do the same within Israel, in order to push the narrative of Israel as an apartheid state. Iran has targeted religious Jewish Israelis to attempt to cause them to incite violence against Arabs. And equally disturbing is Iran's strategy to destroy Israel from the inside and manipulate the international media against it. Also, an influx of weapons to Iranian proxies have been used to flame inter-Arab violence within Israel. Crime rates, for example, of inter-Arab violence within Israel has gone up. For example, in 2013, there were 58 homicides, but by 2020, that number stood at 97. And um, we can see that this weapon smuggling is, is going on at a fairly st steady stream where the, the weapons can be used during times of uh, intifada and, and, and struggle within Israel. So it's an internalized weapon. What is also very disturbing, as the ambassador mentioned, is the um, Iranians and the IRGC's Quds Force uh, use international activity threatening Jewish communities and Israelis around the world. For example, many, uh, there were Quds Force operatives who were caught spying on Jewish on Israeli locations, scouting potential locations to have uh, terrorist attacks. And many, uh, many Hezbollah and IRGC sleeper cells have been found in Western countries, including the United Kingdom. And, um, these, these are, these is, this is something that can be thwarted using local laws. And so this is why also awareness in the West is extremely important. 
And we there also will be see... summit to in the radio at that, and it's even more confusing as you don't, per, don't see me probably. Uh, but I'm this unlucky person who needs to remind about the time. Of course. Are, are... I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Almost done. Yes, sir. Bear with me. <laughs> so here we can see that um, these. Th uh, another area that needs to be uh, addressed before I uh, conclude is Iran's um, human rights viol violations against Iranians themselves. And this is also something that is um, deeply disturbing and sad, especially as we mentioned, that the Iranian people are enlightened, they are open, they're open to the West. And um, this is... Uh, Iran's human rights violations are also something that are being addressed and needs to be addressed more in Europe, where, for example, um, in Sweden is trying Hamid Nouri under the principle of universal jurisdiction, where um, he is being tried for atrocities in an Iran in Avin prison massacre that happened in 1988 with the killing of uh, 5,000 political pr prisoners. So all in all, I would, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm um, looking forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you so much. So we are back after the coffee break and we have the panelists with us. One panelist you already know, Dr. Efrat Sofer is with us via Zoom. Uh, and we have also uh, Dr. Stanislav Smolen, uh, a former ambassador of Poland to Iraq. PhD from Diplomatic Academy in Moscow, and at the end of the 70s and in the 80s, he worked at the Polish embassies in Kabul, Afghanistan, and Islamabad, Pakistan. Since the 1990s, his area of focus has been Middle East affairs. He opened Polish diplomatic missions in Sana'a, Yemen, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So he is a great specialist to talk in this panel. We have with us also uh, Major General and Professor uh, Bogusła. Patsek, who is a professor at the Institute of the Middle and Far East Regulonian University, and he's a Dr. Honoris Causa of the Ukrainian University of the Air Force, and he was a chief commander of military gendarmerie and a deputy director of the EU military mission to Chad and the Central African Republic. And he was an assistant of the general chief of staff for the ground and special forces. Welcome, General. And we have Professor Przemysław Turek, um, Professor of the Institute of the Middle and Far East and the Department of Israel and Levant. Uh, he is the um, scholar of Oriental and Polish studies. Main fields of his interest is in New East affairs, the Arab Israeli relations. Mm, especially ethnic and religious minorities in the Middle East, the blogosphere in the Arabic and the Middle Eastern world, and Muslim Orient in Western culture. Warmly welcome to Professor Kurek. And we have uh, almost an hour for the discussion, and I will be trying to moderate the discussions. Uh, and I will ask the questions, but if you would like to add something uh, from your side or to reply, to respond to anything that the other panelist is saying, um, please do. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, Ambassador Smolen. Uh, uh, you're a specialist uh, in the Iraqi affairs, and we already learned about the relations of Iran and Iraq a bit. And we had this leaked intelligence, Iranian intelligence, uh, three years ago that was published by the Intercept Journal, uh, describing how the Iranian intelligence um, penetrated the, the, the Iraqi state and used the agents of the CIA, for example, um, for their needs. How do you assess the, the scale of the penetration and the, the control of the Iranians in the Iraq and what can be the results of it? 
Before I start, I would like to ask Dr. Rafat Safer uh, about the question which, on the way, I was uh, to raise. Are still Gukush and Ofra Haza popular in Israel? You, with your Iranian uh, roots, are you listening to Gukush? Atman? Of course, I listen to Gugush. I also listen to um, to Martik, and there are new. There are also new artists, new Iranian artists like um, Shakar Pinesh Baju, um, who is a new hero of the Iranian opposition, who is uh, hugely, hugely um, popular in 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 Iran and across the world. And also, there's Ofra Khaza. The, the amazing Yemenite singer, the late of Rahaza. And one of my personal favorites is Rita, who is who has Iranian origin and her, and I highly recommend she's got an all Farsi um, CD, an all Farsi album out, which was one of the best selling um, albums in Israel. So <laughs> It's ve- the, the Persian culture is very much integrated within Israel. And so there is that, um, there's that artistic interplay, which is fantastic. Thank you very much. We still remember <laughs> of Ahaza when she got the second place in Eurovision competition in 83, with uh, and her songs, uh, Deliver Us and Temple of Love. Uh, so this is my generation, let me say, She's a legend. Uh, She's an absolute legend. Yeah, that's, that's thank you, thank you so much. Anyhow, coming to to Iran, well, nothing is finished. Uh, so, uh, southern part of Iraq uh, has been transformed into Iranian protectorate, and it's uh, going on. Uh, as far as political penetration is uh, uh, very much effective. And do not consider the recent setbacks in elections uh, in Iraq and uh, in Lebanon as the signs of the end of Iranian hegemony. That is not true. It is a very, I would say, uh, premature assumption. So, anyhow, if Iranians have problems, they are moving to obstruction. And now we are just, let me say, observing this process because after so eight months elapsed since October parliamentary uh, election came up uh, in Iraq, and we had no new president, no new government, and we have the uh, political system uh, paralyzed. Uh, so, uh, Iran is as skillfully. Uh, use uh, pro Shia uh, militia with the allegiance to Iran, not to the state of Iran. Of course, you may say there was nothing of such uh, development and phenomena during the uh, war between Iraq and Iran uh, uh, in uh, 88. So all Ira- Iraqi Shias used to fight Iranian Shias. There was no, there was clear cut allegiance to the state, not to the religion. This time we had a very, let me say, diluted picture. Even uh, the highest Shia authority, uh, Ayatollah uh, Sistani in Iraq, is unable to convince Iraqi Shia to be allegiant to Iran. So this is a new a new situation. Secondly, this process of colonization by, uh, in, by Iran is on the Look to such a small laboratory in Nineveh province. Yes, Iranians, this popular mobilization forces, uh, help to remove, to, uh, let me say, uh, uh, Islamic State, but instead of conquering Mosul and leaving, they stay and they are now <coughs> entrenched 
to its their own structures, Shia structures in Mosul. They behave like the Red Army in Poland after 45. Instead of liberating and uh, withdrawing, they used to stay, imposing their structures and their, let me say, ideology. So anyhow, nowadays, if you look at, uh, uh, at the Geneva, the province, you will have all ethnicities, all uh, <clears throat> religious denominations, they have their own PMF uh, factions. And even in Batella, the very, let me say, Christian place, even the center of Christianity in this, let me say, part of, of, of uh, Iraq, uh, they have constructed uh, to Iranian money funded by Iran a school, and they name it after Imam Khomeini. So it's not at all. Mosul is full of Shia offices. And this is a long-term policy to erase Arab identity, to remain, let me say, as a main source of chaos. And please keep in mind that Iraq is extremely important for Iran because it is the only window to the Arab world. And through Iran, they have access to Syria and to Syria, to Lebanon and then to Israel. So this corridor is vital for any, let me say, security uh, uh, concerns of Iran and will not be easy to change the situation. And as uh, His Excellency said, this is a very low cost adventure policy thanks to this, let me say, split among Iraqi Shias, among Iraqi Kurds, and even Iraqi Sunnis. So it's a very big crisis, and we will observe it and monitor it very close. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I would like to get back to uh, Dr. Sofer and the panel is about the uh, destabilization caused by the Iran in the region. I would like to also add the uh, internal Iranian dimension. You as an expert probably would have something to say about the stability of the regime, about the uh, strength of the opposition groups. Are we even can think about the change of regime and would it cause more instability or stability in the region? Well, I think what's been interesting to note among the um, ongoing protests is the uh, the wording and the narrative that's if, if we look at the discourse uh, within the protests that it's it's increasing waves of uh, um, dissatisfaction with with the government and with the uh, with with the leadership and and um, in particular with the foreign proxy wars, we, internally we're witnessing that Iranians themselves have uh, limited limited access to 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 sufficient um, food. Recently, the subsidies have been uh, tampered with recently, and um, uh, to to electricity and to other kind of all the, the modern modern all the mod cons and the uh, Iranian people being the very intelligent people that they are um, have uh, have have seen that this is this is their their money wasted this is their their own people's money wasted and so there is growing discontent in that to what extent they will be able to topple the regime is difficult to tell. What I, what I do know is that the regime will stop at nothing in trying to quash that those rebellions because um, they have much more to lose. The regime in its loss of power, because you have, you have to also realize that um, internally the regime's power isn't just hard, uh, hard uh, coercive power, it's also economic. The regime has it's a very firm hold on the economy um, through the IRGC, through um, through leaders who have direct economic benefit from control, and so they will not go lightly. If we could wave a magic wand 
and have a more uh, outward looking regime in, in a good way, in a, non, in a benign way rather than mal a malignant way, I think with the, it would transform the region. I think it would be beyond our wildest dreams, the stability and the, um, the stability and the uh, productivity and positivity that could, could come. But I think getting to that stage would be extremely difficult. Okay, thank you. And uh, so Turek, uh, you are an expert in the minorities in the Middle East. And so we already talked a few times about the Shia minority and how it is used by the Iranian uh, diplomacy. And Ambassador Smolin talked about the um, uh, Iraqi case. <coughs> Can you elaborate more on uh, other places in, in the Middle East and perhaps globally? where we can see the influence of Iran, how we assess it. Before we start, I mean, with the minorities, I would like to, to ask one of you a question. Is really Iran a lonely hunter in the US? Because according to the many, many expressions here, many statements here, you know, uh, Iraq, for example, is a proxy of, uh, of Iran, almost a proxy. But, uh, you know, Iran, Iraq represents this 60 or 70 percent of, of Shia as a as, as, uh, as, uh, majority. The minorities in, the, in Iraq are rather concerned with their well-being and uh, rather focusing on closer cooperation with Kurdistan. Kurdistan is a safe place for many minorities, including Christian minorities. So this, this question and the problem of the province was, was also raised by Kurdistan. Once. Secondly, uh, uh, although Iraq is a mixed country, I mean, there are several minorities, the minorities play rather a marginal role in Iraq. Because the country is uh, overwhelmingly Shia. With Sunni minority, which is opposing in many cases still the, 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 from time to time the regime. And secondly, uh, Iraq is a good, let's say, ally, uh, ally for Iran. Why? Lastly, in Baghdad, we have to deal with the meeting of Saudi officials with Iranian officials. Something <laughs> incredible, you know? Sunni, Wahhabi, Arabi, Saudi Arabia, uh, who quench, which quenched the, the, the Shia rebellion in Bahrain almost, well, is uh, trying to, to, let's say, to get uh, uh, on the normal ter terms with Iran. Of course, it's, it's just, uh, okay, uh, the, the, the diplomats would say, okay, we are to do with something like progress in the, uh, in the, in the talks. That's one thing. Another thing is the, the relations with Syria, which is also multi, multi let's say, cultural, multi ethnic, uh, multi religious, and so on. So, Syria, although we have to do with Shiite minority, yes, <laughs> allies, it's a strong ally, I wouldn't say plus, ally, since, well, 70s. Since 70s. Syria was an ally in the uh, uh, Persian or uh, Arabic, let's say, world, let's say, not something like, like this. So, you know, Syria and Libya were the, the something like allies of, of, of Iraq at, at, at that time. Using this Shiite minority by, by Iran was already mentioned by His Excellency and the other, other persons. That's normal. But the Shiite minority, the uh, minorities differ. Uh, for example, what do you have to do with the Shiite minority in, the, in the early Saudi Arabia? Well, it's a problem with Saudi Arabia, for to speak. It's only something like fueled by, by, by Iran. Uh, Shiite uh, Shia, Shia my minority in Iraq. Oh, it's another question. I wouldn't be so eager to say that, that uh, Iran is going deeper and deeper in policy of Iraq, because the clergy of Iraq is not necessarily in the really good terms with the clergy of Iran. They have some... Uh, points of disinterest, and I'm afraid uh, the, the more the, the Iranian 
clergyman will try to focus on Iraq, the bigger the opposition inside of, your, of Iraq will be. Uh, Dr. Soffer mentioned the, 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 the economic questions of Iraq. That's something which will, will, will be also connected with minorities in, in Europe as well. So the Kurdish minorities <laughs> and others, all those Hazar, Armenians, and whatever, uh, which is connected, of course, with, with, with one question. Will Iran will be so uh, strong militarily to quench all those, those, uh, those uh, uh, the protests? Economical protests, right? Right now we have the protest, uh, strong protests in Iran because of economical reasons, general, general. So the economics usually uh, destroy the regimes. I'm not quite sure it will be the question uh, of uh, of uh, of Iran, but still it's a good topic. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. And uh, one remark to you that there will be time space for the questions, so you can think of the questions now, and we will come back to it at the end uh, of the panel. Uh, uh, Professor Pacek, you are a specialist uh, in the strategic studies, so I would like to bring on the, the global context. And for years we've been um hearing about the multi about the unipolar world turning more multipolar um with the declining uh potential of of uh, america and now we see the aggression of the russian state in ukraine so we see the reconfiguration of the poles of power uh in the world uh, where does the, the the iran lies here in this situation okay thank you very much I'm staying here to see how many people. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to underline that our point of view depends on very simple answer for the question where are you from? If I am an ambassador of Poland, I'm not sure that many people, including <coughs> Polish ambassador, will accept that Iran. It's a global threat. If I am ambassador of Israel, of course, here I understand your point of view, your excellency. From my perspective, for sure, Iran makes a threat. This is very easy to assess that this is not very friendly a country for everybody, including uh, people sitting here. But I assess that everything what is doing Iran now is similar to many countries because not only Iran makes similar situations and similar threats. If we try to think about the future, the picture is different. And this is why I agree, I accept that Iran will be a part of a global threat. If we observe what is going on nowadays in the world, we see two, maybe three huge countries and they rival, unbelievable rival. United States from one side, China from the second side, and Russia. We, of course, observe what is going on in Ukraine. This is the screen for today. What will be tomorrow? I don't want that tomorrow will be huge war, but many experts repeat that war between United States and China with the presence of Russia and some other countries is possible. If it's possible, we can assess that United States and China is going to be ready, is going to be prepared to the critical, very important situation maybe in five, maybe in 10, maybe in 20, nobody knows exactly where and when it will be. I mean this beginning. The United States 
of course, is doing a lot. We observe AUKUS, Australia, Japan, NATO countries. Of course, we understand that our big friend, US is our big friend. It's big alliance to be prepared for something what will be really difficult for US. And from the other side, China, frankly speaking, tries to do the same. We observe what is going on with some last events. Russia, they have the same enemy, US. If you observe what is going on with India, it is a little bit surprised that India last it is maybe some weeks, some months, uh, is closer and closer to Russia, not to China of course. <laughs> and to summarize both sides, I would like to say that Iran, step by step, is closer and closer to be in the same family where China will be in the future. China and Iran cooperate from 80s, not from yesterday, with building or cooperating with nuclear different issues. Beginning it was 1980, when China helped build a research reactor and supply for four other uh, reactors. Uh, what it means? Nothing, because uh, of course it's their choice, yes? But if we add that last year in March 2021, Iran and China signed a 25 years cooperation agreement, including political, strategic, and economic components, it means that we have more evidences for this cooperation and maybe soon closer cooperation. If I want to assess what is going on in military area, it's of course 90% of many different events. It's a secret. China doesn't inform and Iran the same. They don't inform about details. But for sure, China supports very much Iran, and Iran is playing a very friendly role in Chinese military plans. Of course, so far we can say about researches, about trainings, about education, about future, um, uh, or about current high technology, and more and more. From this perspective, if we accept very simple assessment that US is the first enemy for sure for China, for sure for Russia, and for sure for Iran, and for sure for Iran, if China really will achieve you know, this future alliance with Iran, it changed absolutely this picture what we have nowadays. Because nowadays we think mostly about Middle East, mostly. Ambassador uh, showed this picture with possible target of Europe. Yes, you are right, absolutely it is possible. But so far in European countries, very seldom, you know, expert says that it really will be against European countries. Maybe they are wrong because we have to be a little bit uh, more flexible in our thinking about France. I am right or not thinking about Iran as a future member of Chinese, Russian, and with some other countries, alliance against West countries. So far, nobody knows. But if I am right, it makes really very, very big threat because it means that 
not only Iran, not only you know many different uh, details what we have now in the East will be, will be very important because if I write that we will have the future realistic war with the very active rule of Iran, it means that our topic today, Iran is a global threat, is a good topic. One small stone <laughs> for Israel. Israel in this gay place, oh, it's a pity that it's outside, place very, for me, it is a group. And I think that Israel is going to make the same mistake like Germany with not Simba. Because so far, Israel, is happy having fantastic friend United States and fighting, you know, using different tools with Iran, with not only with Iran, of course, but Israel at the same time supports China, having a lot of contracts, a lot of different uh, type of cooperation since 2010, China and Israel and hence bilateral economic many areas with benefits for both sides. We are closer and closer to the decision. We observe this picture in Europe and very far, very, very soon we will have a choice or America or China. I don't know that uh, if we assess only you know, economy, it's crazy, this point of view. If we really believe that maybe this rival will move to the realistic world, no choice. You have to be always China, always United States. Thank you very much. Does any discussion want to reply to any other discussion speech? Or do we move to the questions? Efra, do you want to add something? Oh, yes. Like to add okay. Something. Well, uh, if you look at the current situation, then uh, to the Middle East and Arab world. So you see that the security issues of Arab wars are decided by Israel, Turkey, and Iran. This is, uh, of course, with certain involvement from outside Russia. Uh, US declining military presence. So it's a very disappointing picture for Egypt, for Saudi Arabia, for Iran, who used to play a leading role in the past. So, as currently, as it was, let me say, stated here, so we are unable now to engineer. Regime change in Tehran, in Iran, in Iran. We are unable to eliminate Iranian influence in the region. Because, no, we are unable to eliminate nuclear and missile programs of Iran. Then the whole idea. Uh, hopes and activities should be devoted uh, to the, let me say, support of democratic aspiration of Iranian people. So far, we have concentrated our efforts, I am just talking about US and, and, and Israel, on these two main, let me say, activities, on nuclear problem, Beside and 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 uh, let me say uh, regional ambitions. So it's time to shift our attention also to this. Let me say third pillar of our activities. I mean the support of democratic aspiration of Iran uh, people, taking into account knowing the value of this particular policy. In Europe, 
after Helsinki Agreement in 1975, and let me say Russian uh, uh, Russian uh, 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 developments uh, at the end of 90s. So this is a question to Dr. Safer. How Israel perceives this particular activity in supporting democratic aspiration of Israeli citizens? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that question. And I've got an, uh, another, another pillar to add to our third pillar. Um, I think, first of all, Isra Israeli, Israel and its democracy, I think we have to remember that Israel is, is the only Western democracy in the region. And um, I think it's, that's why Israel is, is to be supported. And I would wholeheartedly concur with, with, your, uh, with your thesis on, on the third pillar of supporting a more democratic regime within Iran. Of course, the Iranian regime now would argue that they are a democratic regime, that they hold elections. And, you know, lo and behold, about 95 percent of the uh, candidates are dismissed. Um, before 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 anything opens, and so it's a very selective type of democracy. I completely agree that we would need to uh, the West would need to support uh, a, a truly truly democratic Iran and an Iran that would uh, reflect the wishes of its of its people and uh, the peaceful peaceful wishes of its people. And I think that is something that would need to be carefully handled at the same time as um, thwarting Iranian aspirations again, because those, um, and you'd have to also keep an eye on Iran's proxies. So if we were to be, if, if the West were to be successful in supporting Iranian and Iranian democratic regime, you'd still have to watch what is happening with the proxies that Iran supported all this time. 40 years is a long time to support these malign regimes. And so you'd have to keep a keen eye on that. If I may, just for a second, also add another pillar. And this is a, a pillar where Europe in particular has agency, Europe and the US. It's also um, using its own laws and its own roles in international organizations to buffer the Iranian threat. Iran has done a very good job in, in affecting UN voting, for example, United Nations voting. I don't know whether you know, there's a, a vehemently anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic commission of inquiry going on in the Human Rights Council at the moment. Um, there's also the, the standing agenda item in the UN Human Rights Council, uh, item seven, which slams Israel every single time. Things like that that are very, very um, effective uh, to change. And this is something that European countries can change um, domestically by, for example, and they're, they're very, uh, it's, it's easier than regime change in Iran. Both have to be done, but also things like adopting the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, where it enables it enables local um, European authorities to crack down on um, using also anti-terror laws to crack down on potential sleeper cells, on potential um, dissemination of hate. It all goes hand in hand, which I think is why this discussion is so, so, so valuable. And also on another front, as the Major General was talking about China, I completely agree with you. I think Chinese activity in Israel also needs to be closely watched. For example, they, they, there was a lot of debate when um, China, a Chinese company wanted to buy the port of Haifa and to buy um, key, key um, Israeli industry companies such as Nuva, the dairy company. And so this is something I completely agree, like uh, Europe, where that needs to be watched closely. Thank you. Uh, Professor, could I yeah, something? That was uh, an answer I was expecting. Why? Because of economical reasons and the question of stability of regime based on economy, 
which is one, the one very important topic concerning Iran. Why? Because it's not only the question if its regime is very strong, having an army and so on. And that, for example, in Iran, we have to do with two generations, never knowing other regime than this one. But it's a question of policy, economical policy. Iran is desperate in trying to sell its oil right now. It's trying to, 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 to manage an agreement with US, <laughs> with Europe, say, look at those ugly, okay, the Russians, but maybe not ugly. There you have problems with Russians, but we are here, we have no oil. That's not something we, we, can, we can barter, let's say, we can do think, think about. It. That's one question. Another thing, uh, the reversing the roles. Again, the Dr. Soft. You're right because it's China playing, it being my main player, not the Iran playing the China, China because it's, it's the reverse. China and Russia are still supporters of Iran, even in the question of, of uh, nuclear, nuclear policy. Because, of course, right now the, the nuclear agency will say, no, Iran is not respect, respecting the agreement and so on and so on. Who will be against the resolution? Of course, Russia and China, because they are, they are supporting Iran, not on the, <laughs> on the reverse. Not it's Iran supporting Russia and China. No, those still big uh, countries are supporting Iran, and Iran is not completely isolated. Even the policy, uh, so-called uh, uh, pragmatic policy of, of, the, of the Gulf states, United Arab Emirates, we have to do with the new new ruler right now, Mohammed bin Zayed, because the, the former is deceased. And they are, of course, trying to negotiate something like, let's say, relations, neutral relations. So again, I would be very cautious with just saying, okay, Iran will collapse immediately. No, <laughs> it's, it, uh, the, the country is too strong. If the economical problems will be solved, again, Iranians will say, shouting, more America, whatever, you know, so, so that, that America, that Israel, that so on, and they will be completely satisfied. Give us the money. You know, another example, I'm just finishing. We had to do with this uh, a man from nowhere, Ahmadinejad. Why he, he had such a big support? Because some parts of society which gained something from him were still supporting. But it is not true that only China and Russia have no tools for, for Iran. Iran is an important player for China and for Russia also. I, 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 I agree. Want, yes, that's true. <laughs> energy source of life and strategic place. In the Middle East. I'm just talking about, about the position. Who is higher, who is lower? China, yeah, yeah. But China is doing a lot, and Russia also, to have, you know, with their allies, their family, Iran. It's a very important country. So, <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. And I promised you the, the time for questions. So now we will move to this part. So, any questions to our panelists? Uh, I have a quick question to Professor Patek. Uh, don't you think that because of the sanctions uh, which are put over the Iran, we are putting this country in the hands of China and Russia? And if yes, what else should we do? A little bit you are right. A little bit you are right. It's not only 100% but you have a choice. You have a choice. It's the same, the same we have now if you observe sanctions against Russia. It works very similar because from one side, United States tried to choose, you know, a specific impact for Iran. Yes, what is the best? Of course, sanctions. But sanctions, sanctions are sanctions. Now, of course, uh, European Union and US using sanctions against Russia, of course, did the same with <laughs> Russia, uh, uh, which is. Uh, Closer and closer to China because of this reason, also uh, with Iran. You are right, but sanctions uh, in uh, Iran uh, play very important role, and this is why Iran uh, did a lot and is doing a lot now, not to avoid sanctions, to change this situation. And this is why sometimes I think 
that the United States, it was not Israel, it's a different story. I said, your point of view depends where I'm from. This is, you know, you, you understand. Uh, about US and uh, sanctions, I think that sometimes the United States, <laughs> too much, you know, stop all chances for Iran to change, you know, their position about nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, and if uh, uh, if if such as real, will have you know bad impact in this rule. The aim, of course, I mean nuclear sanction. The better side. This is why uh, we have to think about balance using sanctions and uh, using diplomacy. United States with uh, uh, Iran made. Unbelievable mistake, my assessment. You know, uh, uh, because you, you remember, you as class president. No, no, tomorrow we will be war. No, it was a mistake. President Joe Biden changed this. Of course, still, in the, um, uh, from American point of view, Iran is not the first enemy because China is first, Russia is second, Iran is the first. <coughs> no, Korea, fourth. Still, but it's not the same position, and relations are much more different. I think that US is closer now uh, to discuss, to change, but closer doesn't mean that they will change tomorrow. But sanctions, if I may add here. Yes, sanctions are working when they are universally applied, everybody is following them. <laughs> but in case of this maximum pressure uh, imposed by policy, imposed by uh, uh, American uh, administration, uh, so it's total failure. It was illusion. Because there are no trade effect between Iran and US. All the Iranian trade is concentrated on two thirds of oil, of Iranian oil, goes to China. No. The main activity of, 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 of trade of Iran goes to Iraq. Open border, no control. Border, in fact, is controlled by uh, militia, Shia militia, pro Iranian militia. No revenues from customs office go to Baghdad. They all go to the structures of uh, PMF, uh, popular mobilization forces. So, Iran for just four years have increased its foreign reserves, has expanded military, I mean, nuclear uh, program. So show me then the positive aspects of American policy. No one. No. So, and now we observe this, let me say, discussion, ongoing discussion in the end, either to return to the very, very, let me say, uh, original of the deal of 2015, or to increase certain demands on both sides. America would like to add this program, for example. Iranians would like to delist uh, Islamic revolutionary guard corps from uh, a foreign uh, terrorist organization. They would like to add Yemeni solution to it. There is no clear cut will on Iranian parts because they feel quite strong in the current situation. So sanctions are not the tool in every situation. And Iran is the proof that Americans have miscalculated this approach. And now they have to be, let me say, to, you know, to, to, to uh, revenge on that approach. That's all. Absolutely.
Right. Any other questions? Oh. Yes, Jan? Yes, I have a question about because we started talking about civilities of the uh, solving from the right? And also to report this one point that the talks of uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia are in Bangladesh, right? And I want you to ask you about the significance of the talks. Are they groundbreaking or a point discussion that can change something? Is the question directed to me? Um, <laughs> to you and all the whole Okay. Uh, and uh, that you can also add your question and we'll answer now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have a question because uh, does the economic crisis uh, more hard to in Asia uh, and the consultancy of the countries uh, provide an opportunity for Iran to uh, expansion of star of influence and uh, because recently <laughs> the president uh, comes with uh, officials of Iran uh, about making a big of and uh, of part of the exchange of tea and oil for Sri Lanka. Yeah I have a question about is it possible or not? Uh, anyone else wanted to add to the Quite the question is pool. Maybe if no one else, I have kind of an bottom about about the sanctions. Uh, but do you think that uh, sanctions uh, which are put on Russian Federation are working? Uh, if you compare it to the Iranian, as you showed us, the this is a completely disaster from American administration. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, so, I, I will so maybe let's start with this this question of of uh, so me random talks. I am really cautious because it's a question of uh, something like not a peacemaking, but rather trying to stabilize, stabilize the situation. Uh, Saudi Arabia is feeling threatened from the side of Iran. That's normal. And uh, Iran, on the, uh, on the other hand, is trying to, let's say, play a role of, of, the, of the state who is not so really the, the, something like black sheep right now. You know, let's, let's say that we are eager to talk. Why? Because maybe when we're eager to talk with Saudi Arabia, we gain something uh, abroad. You know, the question of oil is still, still very important. That's not one question. And secondly, you know, as I told you, Iran is not just a stupid regime as some, some kind of person. They have very good diplomats as well for trying, you know, to, to play one state against, against another and showing, look, you know, we are we're saying that we are such, such bad persons. We are just, just uh, 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 putting those seeds of uh, Shiite heresy all around the Middle East. No, no we, are, we are good guys. We are trying just to cooperate. Maybe it's your fault that we are we are seeing such such a such a bad 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 picture. You know that that's the question. I would say we have to be cautious. If there is no result right now. If you're saying okay, the result as you know, the, the talks are promised, <laughs> so it means nothing. You should only the diplomatic point of view. I would like to add to this particular <laughs> thing there. Uh, so. Uh, Tehran has huge asymmetric advantage over Riyadh, over Saudi Arabia. All Shia radicals are willingly going to fight for Iran, whereas Sunni radicals including Islamic State, including Al-Qaeda, are willing to overthrow mm -hmm. the government in Riyadh. So that is quite, let me say, different picture. Quite different, let me say, social, emotional preparedness to fight for uh, Iran. So, but I have one question to to, to, uh, to, to the doctor. Uh, recently, we saw this, let me say, uh, move of, uh, of transferring two islands. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 
Iran and Sanafi uh, to the sovereignty of uh, of Saudi Arabia from Egypt with the consent of uh, uh, Israel. What is the meaning for Israel of this gesture uh, in terms of coming closer to normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel? Dr. Sapper, you want to uh, answer of this course. question or, and, and the previous ones? Of course, yes. First of all, gentlemen, you hit the nail on the head in talking about the skill of Iranian negotiation. They invented negotiation. And I think that's something that the West undervalues. I remember being in London when the first JPOA, JCPOA was being, um, was being negotiated. And they were talking at, at Chatham House. And it was when I was finishing my PhD. And I used to go to the library to, to do some writing. And um, a few of the Iranian negotiators were there. They had some seminar and I saw them in the, in the staircase going down to get my lunch. And they were saying in Farsi how they could not believe their luck in the negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that is something that I will never forget because referring back to sanctions, back then the sanctions were really biting. And I think the, the West was so willing to get a, a deal done that it undervalued the West's own hand. And that is something that frustrates me most about the 2015 agreement. And I hope, I hope that the negotiators now have taken that into, into account. A second point also on, on the sanctions and sanctions relief. I think we saw in 2015 what Iran did with its unfrozen assets and with its, its uh, almost with its cash reward for the first JCPOA. The money went into more technology development, into UAVs, into missiles, into enriching uh, uranium. So I, I think if I were to whisper in the ear of, uh, of the decision makers, I would say, please make sure that this cash is readily, readily um, secured for the Iranian people, because I think that's, that's something that, that has to be watched very closely. On the two islands, I'm so glad that you brought it up. It's um, it, it shows a very in a very concrete and, and much more public way. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman's first of all his um, his uh, growing confidence. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the talks with Iran. Also, I think it has echoes of the Emirati foreign policy um, that tries to dance in a lot of weddings that tries to keep everyone everyone happy and they're seen as um as the negotiator and as the peacemaker and as the bridge builder i think that was where the emiratis did exceedingly well but i think when you talk to emiratis and especially bahrainis the bahrainis are very very worried about iran turning up the heat every once in a while in, its, in, in the Shia community within Bahrain and trying to destabilize the regime. And so ab absolutely excellent point. I think that the, um, the island, the transfer of the islands is a very, very important symbolic gesture and a very important security move to, um, to reflecting how much closer Saudi Arabia is, is getting to Israel. And as Mohammed bin Salman consolidates his own influence uh, domestically, I think he feels a lot more uh, confident in having these more public moves um, towards Israel. And I think vis-a-vis -vis the US, it's, it's an important move also, because I think um, the Gulf, uh, the Gulf's uh, relationship with the US, which is excellent, I think Gulf countries still see Israel as a secure regional ally to interact with on Iran. So I think, I think hopefully we'll be seeing um, a, a, an even deeper rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Thank you. Well, to, uh, for your question, uh, something in Russia and uh, for Russia and for uh, Israel, of course, uh, 
uh, you are right that both assumptions uh, they have very small turnover, uh, but we have to remember about time. Sanctions from the beginning always they attacked this country which tries to use sanctions. After that, of course, if we have time, long term, uh, of course, uh, the result will be absolutely different. This is why Russia and, East, and Iran both they try to do something to change the situation because uh, they uh, know and they expect that uh, it will change. Here, we have to clear the situation worse for us. But so far, we are right. Uh, no uh, impossible mission. For Russia, the result also is zero. Shuffling. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all uh, speakers and to our audience. And I will leave the privilege to conclude our panel to the session as well. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank our honorable guest, I mean, Exams, ambassador. Everybody passed all exams. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we will see. Uh, Dr. Sofer, it was a pleasure to meet you on the online. Uh, the, the, the Major General Patrick, and it was a pleasure well, for us all. Yes, not okay, yes, Professor <laughs> Patrick. Okay, uh, unfortunately, his Excellency Ambassador of the States of Israel has to, to leave, uh, had to leave earlier, but it was a fruitful conference. We could share the, 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 the points of view. Uh, we started with rather more diplomatic uh, presentation of uh, Iran, uh, the Israeli, and the Near East relations. Uh, and the second part clarified many points. We were not uh, eager to say it openly as, as the diplomat usually did. So that's why we, hear, we, hear, uh, we, we, we could hear uh, several um, uh, conclusions concerning Near East policy. Uh, the, the Israel Near East relations, I mean the, the countries, and of course the role of Iran, which is still sometimes not so 100% clear in the Near East. Something for us to, to search, and something for you, the young easy researchers, to be to, to continue. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your attention, uh, and thank you uh, to all our guests.